Okay, give us 30 seconds of gold, Chris. For people that don't know what nice is, we're absolute, we're bored out of our heads with it, but what's nice? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it changes every week. Um, <laughs> and this is how I met Chris. I know. I, it's, it's a creative, it's a visual collaboration platform for creative teams. Kind of like, kind of like a cross between Pinterest and Google Docs with InDesign thrown in. Who uses it? Uh, everything, all kinds of creatives, like from uh, interior designers, fashion designers, photographers, film directors. Um, but predominantly, we're starting to see a lot of uptake in the advertising industry. So a lot of ad agencies, that kind of thing. We've got companies, also a lot of queer teams, with companies like Sony, um, Oh, I need to check our logo list again. We've got Sony, we've got Macy's, we've got agencies like Wolf Olin's, Laundry Service, uh, Nordstrom. Yeah. And then the guys you can't Diverse. talk about, the super secret ones. Oh, yeah. Hush, hush. So what is, what's the most, well, you don't need to give us uh, details, but what's the most interesting uh, project that is going on behind the scenes in NICE? Uh, it's been used on a couple of relatively big, um, well, I say relatively big, the, it's been used on some really big, uh, Hollywood productions in the last year or so. Um, and has also been used on some huge game projects, um, game titles. Again, can't say specifics, but, um, for sharing, you know, concept art that kind of thing and, and again research reading between the lines here from what you said without <clears throat> putting words in your mouth you've got you know the big hollywood production companies the big games companies and you know obviously they're using it to storyboard and share their creative concepts and the identity of the game stroke movies or whatever but you just hinted that they're also using it for research are they researching each other using nice mood boards are they using it as, as a tool to spy well, obviously they can't they can't actually see each other's content on nice so it's all private and so on mm. um but no no it tends to be you know uh, you know every creative team every creative project you know the first step is going out there and looking at what's out there and, and gathering references and research together to kind of um develop a, a visual vocabulary for the project going forward and you know common reference points both whether that's internal teams come up with ideas to discuss or you know working with clients to try and you know use these common reference points to figure out okay is that what you're kind of thinking or are we had in the right direction or whatever maybe so chris with the like the definition or description of your company is changing every week it sounds like you're understanding the customer more and more every week is like does that affect the product releases that you're that you're focusing on because you you seem to be putting out we'll get into the details of that but you seem to be putting out new features pretty frequently yeah well we've always been putting out new features pretty frequently we just haven't been always telling people about them and um, so we're getting we're getting better i think at just communicating what we're doing um getting into a better rhythm of that and actually we started to talk about that in a bit but try and just like we've been doing taking an agile approach to our development um for years we're starting to take the same kind of approach with our marketing uh getting a little bit less precious about trying just like with agile development um it's not about trying to do these big bang releases you know but kind of release little and often yeah. Like, what's your main focus at the minute in terms of product development? Where are you guys, where are you guys focusing on? Because Nice can be used in so many different workflows, we've always had a struggle kind of nailing down exactly who we were trying to target it at. Um, and part of that is because it is genuinely useful in pretty much all creative workflows. Um, but... I guess there's a difference between usefulness and value, and it's not equally valuable in all workflows. Um, so we've been, you know, over the past six months or so, more I guess at this stage, slowly sort of focusing more and more on, you know, on which audience we want to really target. 
not that we want to alienate anyone who's finding this useful, useful, but who are we putting our resources into um, to, to try and target it, to, to sell it to. And sorry, how are, so you, we how had, are you making that decision? Like, how do you, because there's so many of them. Well, who who is this worth money to? Who is this actually worth money, worth paying to? So um, you realize that, like, so for example, you know, six months ago, we were thinking, okay, this seems to be most useful to photographers, interior designers, fashion stylists. That well, seems to be who's getting a lot of value out of this. When you start to really look critically at, right, but who pays us? Who's actually going to pay us? But what, what sort of skill do we need in each of those industries to, to make a good business and to be able to continue to develop this the way we want? Um, well, fashion stylists tend to be quite distributed. There's not that much money in the industry. Um, so we need to hit them at significant scale to be able to reach them or we need to go to who's paying them, so the, the fashion retail companies and so on. Um, and on the one hand, that is something we're kind of still uh, exploring in the background, but right now we don't, you know, the more we looked into that industry, the more we realized we don't understand that industry anywhere near enough um, to really do it just at this point. So again, I think fashion is gonna be an industry we can look at in the future, but for now it's probably, um, again, without, without alienating those who find it useful, it's probably not going to be someone we're going to be actively trying to target for the next year. Um, interior design, when you look at the interior design industry, well, it, there's kind of a cross between the residential and the commercial interior design. Um, the money, Significant money is really in the commercial. You know, again, res residential, there is there's some money, sure, but in terms of people paying for tools and so on, um, someone who, is, you know, people who are really getting value out of it are going to be those who are working on big office projects rather than those who are, you know, fitting out homes and so on. When you start to look at the workflows of those big office projects, you realize, oh, flip, they've got all these other tools and workflows that we don't know about yet or don't fully understand. Um, we could bring value to that workflow, but we've got six to 12 months worth of feature development we need to do to integrate with all those other existing tools and workflows. So, Chris, and then <coughs> sorry, go on, cut you off. I was just going to say, photography, so this is kind of where we've been landing, like you realize, okay, we're closest to the photography workflow. Either you reach them at scale, charge them $10, $10 a month, you know, but you need to hit 100,000 of them, and we don't have the marketing budget to be able to do that. Or you find you know, some sort of organization or some sort of customer level that you can target that um, is, it's part of that workflow, but they have the money, it's worth it to them to pay for it at scale. And that, fortunately, turns out to be advertising. So when we look at the advertising industry, um, a lot of that is photography workflows, also animation workflows and so on. A lot of those work, different workflows we've been exploring are all bundled up in the advertising industry, but the difference is ad agencies actually have the money to pay for it and it's worth it to them to pay for because they're doing this kind of work at scale. Uh, Chris, you know, obviously I have, for anyone listening, I have the probably unfair advantage in that we have worked uh, alongside you and, and sort of seen the story. So I probably know more parts of the business than perhaps the standard viewer does here. But <clears throat> what you've described from, from an analytical standpoint is that, well, first of all, you're kind of tra you've transitioned from designer to business person or designer to business focused product manager. So that has, sounds like one of the transitions that's happened at NICE. But then also from your target audience of, um, you know, as you described, photographers, um, fashion designers, etc. What's happening are fashion style, stylists. What's happening there is because of the volume game, your customer acquisition cost is probably relatively cheap and self-service. They can sign up, go for it themselves. But then you're not getting that customer lifetime value curve in that they work on nice for a couple of months. They pay what nine, ten dollars a month or fifteen dollars a month, uh, but the churn rate really kicks in after three or four months, because it's not critical to their workflow. You've now transitioned that to uh, probably a harder sell where it's maybe bigger agency, 20, 30, 40, maybe even 100 people in a creative team. They have huge productivity issues. 
Um, nice is a huge time saver and it makes it a, the creative process much more efficient. And so there's a business case behind the buying decision there. But whilst the acquisition period, customer acquisition cost is higher, it's longer, um, you've got a much longer customer lifetime value. Is that kind of, would that summarize up the transition you've been on? Yeah, that explains things way better. Um, but there's a, there's a big difference between those big sort of agency sales, which are really more like its enterprise sales um, versus that, you know, like you say, zero touch, people coming along and finding us online. Um, it's on, and, you know, most of the big deals that we've got so far uh, have come through people just discovering us online and they're evolving, but even those still take, you know, going, visiting people, meeting people, building relationships, figuring out exactly what they need. Like you say, building a business case. Um, so they're kind of, they're almost two completely different businesses, really. Same product, but selling a large deal to an agency and selling, um, you know, a subscription online that they'll probably cancel after three, four months because, like you say, it's, it's not mission critical to them or... You know, you've got those individuals. If it's an individual using it, then, well, if they don't need it for three months, they'll just cancel and yeah. resubscribe when they need it. Um, that's all well and good. But for a small bootstrap business like us, we need a lot more steady revenue. So, Yeah. And actually, what you've just described about, <clears throat> you know, having the same product, two entirely different business models for two different use cases, the idea of going and doing that almost sales, which to a designer or a product person is totally foreign. But coming from my world as <clears throat> where we live in, you know, selling product management services to other companies is I try to explain this to designers and engineers all the time that actually <clears throat> that sales process, that going and talking to customers, well, it's, it's a long way away from, you know, pushing pixels around a, a sketch file or writing code is that it's actually product discovery too. Um, you're, you're picking up insights around a business case, which makes the features that you go on to build in the next two, three, four months. Um, an awful lot stickier than the ones that you would do if you just stayed in the office. So, so actually, actually it's trying to, you know, uh, change mindsets a lot of the time within product teams is the hardest part um, in that they are, those individuals, they're still designing, they're still developing. They just might not be behind the computer screen. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey for yourself? You know, I knew you five years ago when you started Nice. Um, your background was a web designer. And tell us a little bit about that journey because... Now, when I hang out with Chris uh, for you know coffee or lunch, whatever the conversation is, is churn. It's 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 customer lifetime value. It's stickiness. It's feature dependency no. charts. It's reading uh, analytics off bare metrics. Y you've come an awful long way from from just being a, a snooty snobby designer that cared about fonts. We're not, talk we're not talking about fonts so much anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, although I still do complain about the kerning on the menu. Um, yeah, it's it's been interesting. I think I so I had previously been um, like you say doing web design with an agency here in Belfast, and then we did it evolved into a bit of product design with Typecast, which got acquired by Monotype. And so when I went freelance, I kind of I, th I think I did have this kind of naive idea of if I can just make you know something cool, make something good that it's popular. I can sit at my desk and sell it online and make a business and make a living. Um, I mean, that, that uh, might be possible in some cases, but um, yeah, there's been a few things I've learned. Um, yeah. just initially, we, we released a prototype and it was interesting. We got lots of traffic, but we weren't making any money. And then we started to get users and making some money, but not a whole lot and it's realizing that oh, this needs to be valuable and critical to their workflow the next thing was realizing that actually the story of the project of the product probably matters more than the product itself um which pains me as a product designer to realize that if i it doesn't matter how good the product is if i don't communicate to people how they should use it um and how they, how they can use it and where the value can be in their workflow, then all the features in the world are, are worthless. Um, and it's not someone else's job, it's not my customer's job to figure out how my tool can be used for them. 
core example of this is as a designer, if you're sitting doing research, design research with a, with a, a user, um, it's kind of almost your job to pick holes in your own product to find weaknesses because if they don't find the weaknesses you want to find, you know, you're, you're wanting to find weaknesses so you can make them better. And so you're being, you find yourself being critical of your own product even. Um, whereas in sales, it's not that you uh, gloss over things. It's just you don't necessarily want to put the focus on that because it, you know, can make them think, well, this is a piece of garbage, whereas there's a lot of value. And so you just want to put the focus on the value and move that forward. So that's been a challenge. I can't remember it word for word, but you rhymed off a brilliant anecdote there um, earlier on. So when you build something interesting, you get uh, you get traffic, and when you build something, I, I can't remember the middle line. You get users. users. And then you build. Useful, and you get still. users, and then value, Useful, you, you get customers. Customers, <clears throat> right? So what that that is a brilliant. Uh, I, I bring in a lot of that I think I'm going to steal actually and coin as my own because I feel that that there is product management in a nutshell um, and moving the original traffic to users and users to customers. It's that movement that causes so many people headaches. And I know it's something that NICE has, has struggled with, but eventually prevailed with over the last number of years. And I want to take us back to a moment in time. I actually think we have a picture of it, which we might be able to pull up at some point, um, of the first feature dependency graph that uh, you did maybe a couple of years ago when product analytics became a thing. And I know you might not follow that principle anymore or use that in your, in your suite of product management techniques, but I, I think to a degree you, you use it in principle. And really, um, what I mean by that is, you know, imagine you had, maybe we'll be able to bring a, something up, uh, an overlay, Cameron, but if you can imagine on your left axis, you have a volume of, um, of users, and on the right axis, you have frequency of use, and you kind of plot your features on the chart accordingly. And if you have something that's on, you know, really high and left, it's, you know, it's saying you have loads of users use this very little of the time. And then on the bottom right, you, you could have, um, lots, lots of your users use this, but or sorry, uh, very few users use this, but they use it loads. And then the ones in the top right are are a mixture of both, and kind of anything in between. You've you've kind of got this weird decision whether to cut or just allow a, a niche a segment of your your audience to use it. So over the time, you've released an awful lot of features over five years, and you've had an awful lot of different user types um, compared to perhaps the more typical startups. How have you gone about culling features? You know, at times your product has come under criticism for bugs or for perhaps lacking polish due to the aggressive timeline by which you would release features. And over the last couple of years, you've gone about restructuring it to become an awful lot more of a polished onboarding experience for your users. And perhaps, a, I'm not going to say limited set of functionality, but more refined to a particular use case. Are you able to take us on that journey a little bit and the I suppose the conflicts that arise from it. It's a useful tool, um, but it only shows you half the picture, and this is true of all uh, quantitative analytics. They only show you what has happened already in the past, um, and the challenge I have, the struggle I have with that is that if you're making decisions based purely on that, then um, well, basically you can never justify a new feature because no one's using it currently or, you know, and a lot of the time, you know, so you don't, what you don't know is, well, okay, X number of people are using this, you know, lots of people are using this feature A, very few people are using feature B, but is that because the interface encourages them to use feature A? Is it because that's, is it because feature A is more valuable to them or is it just because uh, that's the way the interface is set up that kind of encourages them along that path? Um, and you never really know that just by looking at numbers alone. That's where qualitative research has to come in, um, where you can get a sense that, okay, a lot of people aren't using that feature right now, but the way that, you know, the problems they're telling me about indicate that that would be a really useful feature. And so, we're missing something, but it's still worth pulling. Um, that said, I think, you know, you're right. We've, <laughs> we've developed a lot of features over the years. And usually, you know, because of the way we were, I mean, we're now, we've now got a full-time development team, but for years we were, because we were bootstrapping, you know, 
you're using contractors as and when you can afford them. So you maybe had two days a week development, and so like, you know, there's a whole discussion in in man you know project management for that kind of part time development schedule. But um, the long and short of it is that you tend to have to just get things over the line in a day or two, otherwise things string out over weeks. So most of the site is kind of built two days at a time. Um, and for a long time that has shown them in the level of polish and bugs and that kind of thing. Um, we tended to build things to make them possible and then worry about making them easy or polishing them in the next round because we knew that in six months or a year we'd be coming around and redesigning that or rebuilding it with better understanding. Um, and that tends to, I, I think the key is understanding. Is, is as your understanding grows of the problem, then you're able to make more nuanced decisions about things. You're able to develop an interface that has, um, is balanced in the right ways, that emphasizes, prioritizes the right things, and doesn't give too much emphasis to the wrong things. Sometimes, like there, there hasn't been a lot of calling, to be honest, features, but there has been a de-emphasizing de in a lot, of in a lot of cases, where we realise that um, we've optimised for the wrong workflow, you know that, that we've we've made things easier for ten percent of people and harder for sixty percent, you know, so that we've got the balance wrong. Um, and as we start to focus maybe more on uh, specific workflows as well, specific audiences that's where we might find that, well, we might optimize to make things easier. We might not make things impossible for you know, lower value customers, for instance, but if it's only a few people using it, it doesn't need to be you know, a priority in the interface, which leaves you with, uh, if you're talking, I can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> I thought, I thought you were just mocking my hand gestures for a bit there, no, or, like was, doing was, sign language. It's just dancing. Um, oh dear. Sorry, no, I, I did want to interrupt you though, because I, th I think what, what you're actually describing here, just for people who maybe aren't as familiar with your business as we are, or Nice as a product, is you're actually describing V2 of Nice, which I, I want to ask you about because um, there's very few companies in the world that are not following the sprint or agile methodology right now, whereby it's on two, three, four week sprint cycles. They have maybe if they want, they have a dual track cycle. So they have, you know, two week sprints and maybe a, a six month track for like longer uh, product discovery issues that they're trying to solve that just can't be done in two weeks. But actually what you've just described is basically V1 of nice and V2. And the only other company that I've seen this do, do this really, really well in the last six months is Typeform, who I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with. They you know, basically spent the guts of a year, 18 months, building out Typeform V2 and then did a big launch. Basecamp have been known for this before as well. I think they're in Basecamp 5 or 6 by now. Um, can you describe to us, <clears throat> and I know I interrupted you, so maybe you had more good stuff to say on the matter, but just when you're answering or, or talking about what you were describing there a moment ago, if you could include that kind of process or what's happening in nice at the moment you know you have built your own development team now over the last year you are you do have the uh, resources in-house to be able to do this now and yet you were doing that sort of big release and yet at, at the same time you're releasing little features along the way so what is your uh, strategy around development and release cycles yeah so i guess the different phases we've gone through are initially it was a side project <clears throat> where it was just like the inspiration the search engine. Um, we started to get some funding, some, not funding, some revenue through sponsorship uh, from lots of kind monitor, MailChimp, usual suspects, um, were very kind in the first year or so. But kind of realized well, we didn't want to take it down on uh, an advertising path, but it was only kind of route to revenue we could see with that product. So that's where we wanted to make, that's where we, the decision came to try and make a SaaS business, to try and make a product that we could sell, you know, that was useful, that had utility and we could actually sell to, to users um, directly. We developed the mood boarding tool as it was then, 
um, to, to try and, and test well, can we sell that? Can is that valuable enough for some people to pay for it? Turned out that it was. And then as our understanding has grown of that problem, we've realized that actually it's not it's not so much mood boarding, and yes, that is part of the challenge, but um, it's presentations as a whole. So probably V1 to V1 and a half was kind of search engine and uh, a mood boarding tool. V2 was really realizing that this is more of a discussion, a, a creative presentation and discussion and feedback tool. Um, and, and so we fleshed, you know, we fleshed out the capabilities of boards. You know, that's where we realized these are, it's not about mood boards, it's about boards in general. Um, what I've realized since, I guess, is that, especially when you look at, say, the advertising industry, or like, I, I think it's true of most creative workflows, they run on decks. The world, you know, the, the process runs on decks, and it's, you know, the amount of time that is being spent creating slide decks and presentations, and basically every agency I walk into, every creative team I walk into, I'd say, well, how much time are you spending creating slide decks and presentations of your work versus creating the work itself? It's usually more than half. And so what has happened, I think, is that our understanding of the problem we're trying to solve has grown over time. And so the product has, has developed to, to address that. Um, in terms of our roadmap at the moment, we're fortunate to have a couple of um, big customers who are, there are certain feature sets that they're looking for that will be useful and will be available to everyone, but it's really valuable to them. And so they're kind of funding development. And so that's features that are, you know, that we can charge for the development of or being prioritized at the moment. Um, and then after that, I think the things that we're going to be focusing on, so the, the, the features we're working on at the moment are around, again, developing the capabilities of boards, developing the, the template capabilities of boards as well to make it a lot easier. So what we're realizing is that, again, it's that thing of rather than giving someone a blank canvas and saying, you figure it out, uh, figure out how our tool can be useful to you. Templates are a really good way to show how people can use it in their workflow. So we're developing those capabilities. The next step, though, will be focusing, really focusing in on the discussion capabilities of boards, um, you know, the adding comments, annotations, that kind of thing. And then there's a whole a host, a, a whole world of kind of, you know, we need to develop the iPad app and that kind of thing, and building pencil support and stuff like this. So there's a lot of exciting stuff along those lines. That said, there's still the search engine, and there's still like I say, value in it. The challenge we have right now, uh, from a marketing standpoint, is where marketing and product are clashing a little bit, is that even though where we're making our money and where we're providing most value is the um, boards, where we're getting most of our traffic from is the search engine. And so as a marketing tool, it seems to have value. The problem is that currently when people land on the site, um, they see basically a Pinterest clone. That's, you know, they look at it and go, oh, that looks like Pinterest, and think they, they get what the site does, and don't realize the depth that there is to it, or the, you know, we're not communicating our, our value proposition really, or our differentiator of that very well. Three of NICE is probably going to be that repositioning, um, sort of taking what we have, but recontextualizing it, and making search in support of boards rather than boards in support of search. Um, I think that'll be easier to do if we actually put a bit of time into tidying up search, or we put a bit of time into you know, freshening it up, giving it another pass, and you know, rather than just moving it and relegating it to somewhere else, also adding value in doing that. So if it's part of that, we can We've moved this elsewhere, um, but we've also 
added a lot of value in doing it. Here's a ton of things we were planning to do for years, and we finally made this tool better, and here's exactly how it'll be useful, and also where it fits in the overall workflow of boards. Um, so I think, like, I think from, like from a brand positioning point of view, you've definitely always wrestled with who, who the customer is, who you are as a designer, and how this started in, in the integral sense of just wanting to provide a tool that solved a problem. Um, and there's obviously that, there's that conflict of you holding on to that as we often joke that you're not a designer anymore, <laughs> you know, but you are a designer, you're like, that'll always be there. Um, and that, that seems to be, that's probably going to be one of your hardest wrestles in this transition to V3. Um, but I'm, I'm just aware of the time here. I could talk forever, but like just as a way of wrapping up, I'm just interested in how you see the brand positioning of nice actually evolving. Um, because at the, you know, at the minute, if you were to land on the nice homepage, it's very much positioned for an individual, for a designer, for a creative, you know, um, but, that's not how you're doing business. You know, you're walking into the head office of Nike and, you know, like you're having big conversations with big decision makers. Um, and they're, you know, they're the crux of your business, you know, now. So, you know, like, are you guys heading towards the Adobe kind of, you know, is, is that where you're targeting or like, where do you, where do you see nice going in terms of like a business prop and like a brand positioning piece? Well, again, it, it comes back to that thing of it being two businesses, effectively. There's the online sales, zero touch, versus the, the bigger enterprise sales. Um, and it depends because we don't, it's not like we have the resources, to, you know, the sales team is me, is me. Um, so it's not like we necessarily have the resources to double down entirely on an enterprise sales solution. I think the ideal would be I mean, those big deals are nice, but if we're dependent on two or three customers, that's not a good place to be in either. Mm. So the ideal scenario would be that we have, um, you know, a dozen big customers, so our, our risk is uh, weighted out there or balanced out, but also, you know, still 50% of our revenue is coming from thousands of smaller customers. Um, that's a really strong position to be in now. Maybe yeah. that we can have our cake and eat it. Um, and that's, that's where we may need to make a tough call in terms of the branding and how we position ourselves. At the moment, we're trying, kind of trying both. Um, so that'll be an interesting thing. There's also the case of, well, where do we want to take the company? And the nice thing about being bootstrapped is that as long as you're paying your bills, you, know, you can do what you like. Um, and my goals as a company are to build a, you know, team of great people that we can just make cool stuff with, frankly. Um, that's, you know, the, there's a big problem to solve here that we see in the creative industries. There's massive workflow challenges. Um, I think boards is a really solid solution or can be a really solid solution to a lot of those challenges, but there will be other problems that we see that we'd like to attack and solve as well. Um, so I do think I'd like to start repositioning Nice as a company rather than a product, and so you know the boards is a product is one of Nice's products. Right. Um, you know, search or the library is another one of Nice's products. I could see us doing a portfolio product at some stage in the future because I mean we're halfway there with boards, um, and so you know I can really see us starting to round out our you know becoming a, a company that has a product range, um, you know, like, like Adobe Creative Cloud or something, at a, at a much smaller scale, obviously. That said, there's also, you know, when you, when you look at the enterprise side of things and those large agencies, um, there is a need for an overall kind of one-stop shop creative hub uh, for these discussions to take place, for the project management to happen, for the feedback and, and approval processes and so on. Um, and so from a product standpoint, that's where we're going to be heading. Whether the company, you know, how much of a difference there is between the product and the company in terms of branding, I don't know yet. 
I know Cam's on our on a wrap up rundown here of uh, some quick fire questions. Chris, my, this is my last one. Very very briefly, there's a lot of very clever stuff going on in the tech stack of Nice. Um, again, <clears throat> behind the scenes, you've built your own uh, layout engine uh, with with machine learning involved in it. You've built it two or three times, and it's getting smarter and smarter. You have a lot of clever stuff going on. Um, can you give us a very brief overview of the tech stack? I know that primarily this is a Rails application, but you've also been playing around with React in recent times. Can you just give us a quick headline on that? Yeah. And why? And why? Uh, so we started out as a Rails app. Um, Pete Hopkins was helping me build it initially. Um, you know, was new Rails, so that made sense. And I think it still was the right call. Um, and then over time, we realized that we needed to add back, we use Backbone as our JavaScript framework, that kind of thing. Um, initially, we had no framework, so it was literally just a Rails app, HTML and CSS, and it was an absolute mess. Um, over time, what we've realized we've had to do is try and separate things out to the more API based. Um, so by decoupling the front end from the AIs, we haven't developed an API anyway for iOS apps and so on. Um, we've been expanding that now to the point where even though the front end is still on the same server as the back end, um, as the Rails back end, 99.9% .9 of it is being run off the API anyway. So if we can get that to 100%, then we can de decouple things out. Um, and then that frees us up to, heck, if we want to swap out the API for PHP or whatever, or Node or whatever the cool thing is, um, then we can do that. If we want to swap the front end into something else entirely, we can do that as well. We've been, uh, over the last few months, kind of transferring from a backbone front end framework to React. Um, we kind of debated React versus Vue for about a month or so. Um, I personally like Vue a lot, but it just seemed like we were, we tend to be doing things that are kind of on the edge of what's possible in browsers anyway. So it felt like going with React is the right choice there because of the sheer size of the community around it and the fact that people were probably going to be solving problems that we were facing before we got to them. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're in the middle of that position to React. I'm seeing already a huge benefit from just, whether it's React or Vue component based um, development just makes so much more sense. Um, and leave us with a much with a much cleaner code base. Um, so I'm going forward. Then we might be able to reutilize some of that with the app made for the iPad app, which is currently written entirely in um, Objective C. So, uh, but I think for us, the tech stack is always evolving. Even though we've chosen React, for instance, we know that in three years' time we're going to be having the same discussion about what we should be changing to. Um, and I think the biggest. Uh, the most important thing, well, besides what technologies we choose today, is building things in a way that when those technologies are no longer relevant, they're decoupled in a way that we're able to easily swap them out. Um, so assuming that whatever we invest in today is probably going to be wrong in five years, helps us to kind of make decisions that make fewer assumptions as we're developing things. Um, that makes it easier for us in three to five years to start transitioning to the next best technology um next most suitable here thanks so much for taking the time to chat this chris i've i mean i had a list of 50 questions and we barely got into them but um i liked where we went anyway it was good fun F finish up there's one cameron didn't ask um but i just want to know what you think's the biggest product myth uh you know there's like Two years ago, everyone was either like very specifically a you know a UX designer or a UI designer, or you had uh, on the d engineering side there was full stack, and you had uh, people who were front end, etc. And now everyone's just a a product person, and it it's the coveted title, it's a coveted buzzword at the moment. But there's a lot of nonsense talked about it as well. So mm -hmm. just from someone who has built a product for five or six years and you're very modest about it in terms of where you are, but um, I think Nice has achieved extraordinary heights in terms of usage, mm. um, and it's now come in a, a thriving business. So, what is your, what do you consider to be your, your the biggest product myth, or one of? 
Well, build it and they will come is total BS. Um, I mean, they might come, but whether they'll give you any money is a whole different story. Um, <laughs> nice. That's a good one to end on. Um, thanks, Chris. I know your time is very precious at the minute. You seem to be working your ass off, so really appreciate the time. Good to catch up. <laughs>